here with us, we have um, a speaker with a very interesting career to show. Um, I was very interested to hear that um, he uh, descends from a family of railway workers, actually, and he himself also started off as a managing clerk in the railway industry. And um, actually, he wanted to become a sports professional, which uh, didn't then work out due to um, injuries. But luckily for us, um, after a while, um, he realized that his real passion is with IT and computers. And then he switched the industry, um, joined the medical sector, um, was working with ISAF, um, the Service Institute um, für Ärzte und Apotheker, where he was um, considered with um, interactions of drug uh, ingredients. And then two years back, he then joined Konux, um, a startup um, working with um, AI to analyze data, um, improving the maintenance of infrastructure in the railway industry. So he kind of returned to his roots. And I'm really looking forward to his talk and about the, um, to the stories he is going to tell us um, how this data can be utilized to improve the maintenance. So please give a warm welcome to Mark Gaines. Yeah, hi, or good morning still, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Mark Gaines. Um, I'm working for Konox um, for two years, roughly. Um, my role there is uh, being the, well, the architect, chief architect, something like this. Um, today, what I want to, not, oh, now it's working. <laughs> A couple of words, um, who we are and what we do, right? Um, this is our vision, transform railway operations for a sustainable future. Well, a lot of words and buzzwords. What does it mean? Well, I can tell you what it means to me personally. Um, as, as he said, um, I was working for the Deutsche Bahn before, since before I entered um, the IT industry. Um, if you look at, at our future, um, also on mobility and climate goals we have, we have to change things, right, to reach these climate goals and, and still be mobile as humans, right, um, uh, commuting to work and, and things like this. Um, so in the end, I believe that railway industry will play a key role in future mobility concepts, any future uh, mobility concepts, if you scale this on a country or a continent or something like this. So that also means we have to increase the capacity of existing railway networks. We can't just build new railway networks. There's no space, especially in, in Germany. In China, it's different, right? They can build a new line there. Villages have to disappear. Well, we don't have this space, right? We have to use what we have. So increasing capacity, well, the infrastructure of a railway network is important, right? So you have to treat it in a good way that it stays yeah so you can increase the capacity you can for example double the traffic on that railway uh, network that also means inspection regimes have to change um for example or to, to visualize this a bit um there's a rule in, in the deutsche bahn that every switch in germany has to be inspected well every three months let's say right so, and we have roughly 70,000 switches in Germany in the existing railway network. So if you double the capacity or the traffic on this network, well, you have to be as twice as fast in inspection, uh, inspecting these, these switches. So this is unrealistic. There's not enough manpower to do this and, and so on. So we developed something to continuously observe, measure, monitor switches on, as part of a railway network, because switches are the most critical element for us, and also re responsible for roughly 20% of all the delay minutes uh, of Deutsche Bahn, for example, right? So this is why I work for Konux. I want to solve this problem. <laughs> Um, and since I started at Konox two years ago, well, it was quite a journey. Um, um, we had a Series C round we won, so we collected something like $80 million um, to right, grow and invest. We won our first, well, it's maybe the first tender in this industry, won by a, by a startup, an AI startup. Um, so now we are also in the delivering phase. We have a paying customer now. 
And so we have to deliver and also on the other hand, be innovative, right? Find new things to solve. So this is not really working somehow. No, not reacting at all. Well, I can go on like this. <laughs> um, so uh, subject of interest for now for Konox is the switch of, as I said, um, the, the railway network. It consists of multiple parts, right? If you look at it, um, there is there's the, the, let's say the beginning of a switch where you have moving parts, you have, you have motors or machines just moving steel around, right? <laughs> to define the direction the train has to go. Um, there is, at the center of the of the switch, there's a component called froft, right? Where, where let's say the decision finally has made which direction this train goes, right? It looks like a bit of a, of a triangle. I don't have the picture here now. Sorry. Um, so the frog also is physically there are two rails coming close together but never connect. There is a gap between two rails. This is the frog. So. And what we measure in the end is when the train goes over that rail, it leaves one rail and it crashes, literally, it crashes into the other one. Right? So there's a tip, there's an edge, and over time, this degrades, right? And this you can measure. Um, how do we measure these things? Um, well, there are different ways. Um, to measure this, we built this. This is a piece of hardware designed by us, well, programmed by us, produced by somebody else. <laughs> this is not our core business. That thing weighs roughly 10 kilos. Um, there's a PCB inside, there's a, an antenna inside or a pigtail. Um, most of it is battery. These things are battery powered. There's no connection to any power. Okay, does it work now? Oh, another one. Okay, that's the switch. <laughs> This is the frog I talked about, right? Here's, here's the tip, and every, every train running over crashes into this tip. So this is a very, uh, yeah, not important. Yeah, it's an important part of it, right? And the rest is, the whole thing sits on something called a track bed. These are all these stones, right? And it sits on it. So we measure the, condi the condition of the switch, um, the track bed itself, and other components. So. Um, Coming back to the device, what also was also quite a journey, but that was solved before I started at Konox. Um, so our device can be screwed, can be glued on concrete sleepers or wooden sleepers. Well, this is, I love this picture in this one. These were the early beginnings where we just did some tests and then somebody connected computer to it and First, he, he took a, a small hammer, just dinging it, ding, 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 ding. But that guy wasn't able to hear anything. And then he took the big hammer. <laughs> can you hear this? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I can. Um, so these are installed uh, devices here. Um, the device itself has to go through a lot of tests. So if you install something in a, in a railway or in a, in, at the railroad, it has to be secure. We should avoid that it starts flying around, <laughs> let's say, right? If an ICU goes over 300K an hour, well, there, there are various forces, right? Um, this, this, this guy has to cope with. Um, can I play this video? So one test, this is so amazing, I think. Um, can you? So there is one test this device has to pass it's called an, an ice shooting test. So this is a four kilo block of ice. And they shoot it at our device with a speed of 280 K an hour, three times. And it has to survive. <laughs> Surviving means, right? It's not falling into parts and it still works. It still measures, it still transmits data and all that stuff, right? So that was the hardest test we had to pass, right? 
There are also corrosion tests. We had to do heating tests, salty air tests, if you want to install on a former European island, let's say. Um, another thing is also looseness detection. It's for us, for us, it's important. It's not so much towards the customer, but we need to know if this is somehow broken or not, right? Or getting loose over time. I have to look at the time of this, sorry. Um, and we have uh, a battery lifetime expected around roughly about four to maybe five years, let's say. So this is our device. What does it produce? What does it measure? How does it look like? Um, we receive from this device something that's called an acceleration si signal. So we are measuring acceleration or vibration, right? Um, and well, I have some audio files here. I hope this works. So this is then the, the audio representation of the acceleration signal. What I want to show you here. So here is a train pass over over a switch. So you can literally hear it, hear it, right? That was the first one, a high-speed train, an ICE 240 k an hour pass. And if you have this, I can play it again. The interesting part is you can identify. So in the middle, there was a different sound. So these are two connected ICE uh, trains. <laughs> And yeah, so there are other examples here. I mean, the last one, the second one is a bit boring and a bit long because this is a, this is a cargo train, pretty long, pretty slow, and pretty boring. And this is a passenger train. So you can really hear the sound, right? Um, and this is also one way to work with that data, to interpret it as an audio wave, let's say, right? And then, well, you can apply different algorithms or logics, right, to, to, to interpret this data somehow, right? Um, one thing we do is we convert this vert acceleration data into some, we call it vertical displacement data. It means literally how much this, this thing is moving uh, in easy words. So, and well, it's a complex formula. It's, it's, we call it the algo. <laughs> who does it right it's a magic thing um and you can also see here these are the the, the, the bogies let's say and and here are the echoes so you can count right and you know the number of echoes then you maybe know well it's, it's a high speed gate uh, high speed train yeah and an ice has so and so many axles so that you can identify things like an ice for example that's what we call train classification and, and Excel counting. So, well, that was the easy version, right? We do it a bit more complicated, more sophisticated. We, we apply uh, TensorFlow models and uh, spectrograms and all that stuff, right? To get to this information, right? Is it an ICD or not? So, um, yeah, so much to that. The early days, <laughs> we are a startup still, right? And everything has to begin at some point, right? So usually there's a single guy, right, with good ideas and well-educated in math and physics and whatever is needed, right, um, who creates the first version of this system, this processing of data system, right? Um, normally it's kind of a data scientist, but whatever. So there's one person creating the system, not let's say a computer scientist, more a data scientist. Um, it's a bit of a different code produced by these, uh, these people. Um, that whole system ran on a single server under his desk. Yes. So this thing of a flowery pottery of scripts and languages. So C++, Python, shell scripts, Cron was involved, all that handcrafted. In the background, well, some database or more than one, right? Um, and it just worked for a small number of devices. Well, there wasn't, there haven't been more at that time. So I would have started the same way, just make it work. 
because it's one thing is also clear when we go to, to a customer and see well look at this right we can do this and this and this and this is it there yes i i believe in you <laughs> no we have to prove this right um, the customer has to check everything and they have to allow us to to operate right in, in their network so yeah and then comes the time well we now have a couple more devices so this doesn't work so some architect or senior software developer get hired and well he's happy um, finding this <laughs> as always right but that's part of the game right um then they decided to rewrite this whatever this is or was better to say um the part of the processing because this is our core domain right processing that data is is so important for us if this is doesn't work well we could give up as, as a company right um so what they came up there were, there were a couple of iterations before right um, they built some kind of a data ingestion application well it was mainly a apache camel a based application then they screwed in some spring boot in there don't know why c plus plus components right some pre-processing converting that that signal um then another transformation and here are the first uh let's say interpretations like train classification which is the tensor flow model for example and then everything gets stored to some kind of a database right so and these things in between are message queues RabbitMQ, right if you look at well a lot of message queues for that bit <laughs> to do right um the next then we have to store the data somewhere right that time they used a, a database system or technology called crate io i have to say i've never heard of it before since i started at konux never heard of it right and they started to build or they had already built some kind of backend basing on spring boot but not really modularized more a big ball of mud let's say <laughs> um so looks pretty easy right if not everything is using everything right <laughs> so different various components are accessing this and this and then you have your c plus plus code or directly accessing this or this different protocols this goes over http here this uses a jdbc to go here and these python things have a python driver for the database wow yo can do it that way <laughs> you should um and this was just part of the processing this is half of it so we made a load test with this just with this part and simulated the ingestion or transmission of data from 1000 devices to this guy and until we went to that stage so everything is done it took 20 hours why <laughs> well the main problem was it's processed file by file and if you see that a single sensor can send 100 files per day so this transmits once a day because battery right um 100 files so one after one is running through this pipeline wow that's not a good idea um and the second part of this was applying more models right more statistical models or whatever that's the second part but this was scheduled assuming that the first part this has finished so part of the strategy to orchestrate all this is hope hope is not a strategy <laughs> definitely not and believe me or not this hasn't finished in time and this started we had a mess <laughs> literally right and then you have to clean up in this chaos well good that was let's say the second generation so what was good well on a high level it is relatively easy to understand well we have decoupled elements in between um it was message based it ran on an eks cluster per customer so all this processing all the api backend and the database were running per customer so uh multi-tenancy with sharing nothing let's say <laughs> um transparency and cost well it's per customer it's easy right you just sum it up 
And it was really a relatively easy to configure, but we can do better. First thing and most important thing, this process has to speed up dramatically. Um, running everything per customer is expensive, let's say, from the resource cost and also operational costs and maintenance. And you have to do everything, I don't know, 10 times. Um, C++ and create IO, well, let's get rid of it, please. Nobody knows that code anymore, more or less. And this is just not working for us. Um, we wanted also a centralized system for configurations and so on. Um, and we wanted to dramatically also reduce cost. In addition to this, what we can do better, um, we came up with something like this as a system design high level. So we stick to, to having an ingestion. We built that new. It's still a web application. It's still a Spring Boot application, but completely different. No camel anymore. It's a reactive stream down to S3 directly. Um, it is fast. It is fronted by a by a an nginx instance, which is also the termination point for the mutual authentication and SSL and God knows what, right? Um, so our devices are not talking directly to the ingestion, they're talking to the nginx, which forwards everything. Um, in the middle of the processing, well, this is where the magic happens, right? Um, we wanted to, to start using streams. Um, and we have to be stateful on that. Uh, a minute, in a minute, or I will go into details of statefulness. Um, we wanted to, to organize these things in pipelines, um, and we want to build up a data lake where the processing just exclusively works with the data lake, writes to the data lake, and reads from the data lake, and nowhere else. While well, there is, uh, there's an exception, but later on. Um, and then we have to distribute all the data, right? So um, we have here. Uh, where our providers, data providers, let's say we, we expose data via MQTT, we produce export, we have an application, a backend, and a UI um, that should all work. So we started building up so called, we call it catapults, data catapults, small Spark applications just reading the data and forward somewhere. Here, like Elasticsearch, for example, right? This is a dominating technology here in databases. Uh, of course, there are other architectural drivers um, we have to take into account um, in general. The whole thing, the whole processing, it should be reliable, mature, and it should be fast, right? Then, regarding the costs, um, use AWS managers, uh, managed service as much as possible. Before that, they built everything on their own and invented the wheel every day, more or less. So let's use managed services because we, we are not successful having the best configured Redis database that doesn't make us successful, right? We want to focus on where we earn money with, right, in the end. Um, central praise for data and data code. Um, yeah, this is a bit, uh, part of it is uh, the data lake, but also the code that produces the data that lands in the data lake. So these, to me, they belong together, right? We have to find some common place for this. Um, another important thing is um, what we also do is we, we have researchers in our company, right? Um, that search for new ways of, of let's say, interpreting this data. Um, so it makes it require, uh, makes it, um, well, a must have to whatever we use in these pipelines, every model, every algorithm, or whatever, can also be used outside the pipelines in an easy way. Right. Um, so that was important. Clear tenant separation. <laughs> yes. If you deal with railway companies, which are like a governance like thingy, right? Um, they are a bit different when it comes to data. Well, can we have this in our data center somewhere and nobody can touch and see it and God knows what? Well, so we had to, we definitely had to find a way to separate this in a clear way uh, from on a functional level, who can do what, right? And also on the data level, who can see what, right? And change what. And this is also, well, it's not towards the customer, but important for us, um, for this research, we sometimes, um, we saw this acceleration uh, signal. Um, normally we recorded this with uh, two kilohertz. Um, and for research reasons, we increase that to 20 kilohertz. 
because we can just see more in the signal, right? Or find anomalies and whatever, and then go to the lower frequency signals and like, well, okay, it looks like this. Well, that's, and of course, that was enough. If it takes 20 hours to process data, well, what do you see? If this sends data from yesterday, then we take a day to process everything. So on one, on when I come on Wednesday to work, I see the data from Monday. Yeah, not ideal. So um, as a user, when I come to work, I, I want to see the most recent data. This is what I need, right? It will never be real time, clear, but the shortest delay is possible. So data processing. Um, the way we build it, um, first of all, this is our, more, our most important thing to do, right? If this doesn't work, we have no data, we can't do anything. <coughs> if you see it, look at this, we have some kind, developed some kind of a stack model. So um, there's a, it's a model, reading data, transforming data, whatever, writing data to some, some sync, in our case, Hive um, tables. Um, and that output is part or maybe the complete out, uh, input for another model, right? There's a, there's a chain and you just run to this chain. This is called a pipeline. Um, so we have to execute model one, then you can execute model two, model two, three, four, and so on. You have to follow this defined sequence in the end. So if you look at it, the same thing, you can see this, the sequence, and there's also some kind of a tree or a harness behind it. It's like a topologically sorted graph. So you stand up, the first thing I do is coming out of the shower, or whatever, putting on my underpants before I put on my, my trousers, right? And not the other way around. So you have to follow this. Um, hierarchical context will be going this way up. So we have, let's say, contextual transitions that makes it even worse. Yeah, we need some state management. <laughs> that was the conclusion, but how? Um, and it gets worse. Um, reprocessing is one thing. Uh, processing is one thing. We need to be able to reprocess data. Uh, let's say we, do, we want to deploy a new model which has a breaking API change. So it re, from now on requires data that had never been produced before, right? And here we want to de deploy the model. So we have to go back in time and reprocess data to provide the data required by the new model version. This is one reason for reprocessing. Another reason is delayed arrived data. So our sensors, it could be, I mean, it's mobile, <laughs> mobile connection. It could be that it not, it's not sending for two days. Oh, world going under? No, <laughs> why? So, but at some point it, it, it arrives, right? It, it, there's new data coming and then we have to, to fill the gap with the missing data. So we have to reprocess the data. Other reasons for, for reprocessing is also, um, well, if we have some problems in our processing, <laughs> which never happens, never. Um, but we need to fix this and reprocessing is the tool. But what does it technically mean? You have a data lake, you have Hive tables there, you work with Spark and I don't know, Hadoop and Gamal, right? But a reprocessing most of the time means, means updating data. A Hive table, Parkify. How? <laughs> well, as of now, we deleted that data and produced new. That's the only way, right? Um, at least that's what we found. Um, and it also means we, we, have to re we have to execute the processing, that bloody graph we had there, um, at least parts of it, maybe the whole one. And when we update data, well, it should be secured by some kind of a transaction unit of work, isolation, would be great, right? <laughs> if some, uh, some other uh, process is potting in and destroying my data. <laughs> Weird situation we have. And we need a maintenance window for updating this. So, and from all that, we built this. Um, so start with this. This is the one exception, not data, reading data from the data lake. We have in, as uh, microservices, we have a microservice architecture we planned everything, applying DDD, bounded context, domains, God knows what. So, and here we have three, let's say, uh, microservices in the tenant bounded context. So we have tenant management. Here's a representation of the whole network. 
um, of our uh, the railway uh, network from our customers. This is a Redis graph. This is a Redis database. And here are some configurations also important for processing. Um, there could be that um, any um, thresholds are defined there or whatever, right? Um, so on the left hand, we have the, the, our ingestion. It just streams down to S3, some ingestion bucket, not touching the data at all. Um, this triggers a binary file stream from a Spark application here. So this is running on an EMR. It parses the data, converts, classifies the usual stuff. So this is, if you remember that Pyram might be the lowest level here, the train pass level. <clears throat> And when this is done, when the whole, let's say, transmission has been processed for a single device, uh, then we can start this guy here. But, but to, to detect if this has finished, some state has to be set. So we developed a state, store we call it, right? It's a, it's a Redis hash in the end. And there is a state machine inside which we have built. This is Redis gears in the end. So state store means it holds the state and it triggers because of a, a state transition, something else like this pipeline. So this is all, this always comes together, right? State is just an information, but either you ask for state changes, right? Or you, you have an automated process to trigger something because of the state um, change. And this is what we did. So then we process the next level um, and also the last level and everything goes into S3 in the end. Right, this is our data lake, more or less. Um, so, and this is how it works today, let's say. Um, <laughs> okay, um, this has downsides. This has uh, no. Oh, okay, cool. So, again, we did that for the first part. Now, do it again. The good stuff. Well, it is fast. I said, we took, it took us 20 hours to process that data. This does it in two hours because it's working on batches. Maybe. We have a centralized storage. We have our data lake there. We have some state management. We have the multi-tenancy. The whole thing works multi-tenant. Uh, it is easy to configure. We just had these, these services up there um, and it's just AWS managed services and open source stuff but we can do better. Reprocessing is still a problem for us. We still have to delete data and then put it back um, and fill it again. So this, we, we ignored it a bit. We don't have that much time to implement all this. So this, this we now have to do, right? It requires updates, but we can't really, right? It's technology-wise not easy or maybe impossible, right? State management, is still not perfect. It works, but it's still not perfect. Um, and if you see, if you have these kind of pipelines, you have some shared code or common codes, right? There's, there's the, the, the pipeline itself that wires everything up, right? And if you want to introduce a new box here, you have to touch that common code. And to me, this is never a good idea to have something like this. Um, and we want to be want to have it as easy uh, as possible to extend. So introducing a new box here. So um, what has to change? So this this runs perfectly. It's never any never had any problem. On the processing part, well, this is easy to extend. We have to introduce somehow and state and events. If you look at a state time, also state. Okay. Um, States, we, we, we think we have two levels here. Um, let's start with the events. If we could have something like data events. So if, if I insert a, a, a row into a table, this is an event to me. This is a data event. Think of a DynamoDB table. If you, you have also these event streams there, you can, you can catch, right? And react to it. So something like that would be great to have, right? But in addition to it, we have, we have these states. So let's say you have, you have you, you, you ran through three, three parts of the processing and here you reach a, a situation where you say, well, this is something that could be of interest of others, right? To others um, 
and then react to it. So we have two levels here. We have events and we have states. Um, this we want to put into our architecture somehow, right? So the rest can stay. Um, and here, well, mentioned often enough. So data manipulation language support and transaction we need. Compaction is also important, right? To small file syndrome. I don't know if you've heard of this. We had this. <laughs> um, and ideally, tables as stream source would be great. So, and this is what we want to build now. First of all, um, there are no pipelines anymore, no explicit pipelines. They are more implicit, right? So think of this. This is a technology called Delta Lake. I don't know if anybody heard of this. Um, it is a couple of years already part of the Databricks platform and Databricks are the creators of Spark and the, the force behind it. So, and that offers some things. So if I make an insert here, it emits an event. So I can stream these events with a Spark application, super easy. Um, you can update data in there. You can delete data in there and you can upsert data, which is cool. Thinking about this reprocessing thing, well, this is the missing bit, right? The missing piece. If we can upsert by default instead of just appending. Um, so, and with this, with, with the streaming capability, we build these kind of change, these implicit pipelines, right? Um, without any external thing. And then this guy can emit an event which lands on an event bridge of, of AWS. And there's a, it will get routed because of the information of the, uh, the event type and the, the payload of the event. There could be a Lambda thingy or whatever. And we can, we can route this event to a Kinesis and then stream from Kinesis to react to these state changes, let's say. This is technically how it works or it should work. We are in the middle of building this. <laughs> um, the data tables are already there. Everything has been migrated. Um, and so far it looks pretty promising that this really works as expected. So what are the main goals we, follow, we want to reach here? Data features, yeah, should be like track and play, right? Just put the box in there and say, well, I'm streaming from this table. Relatively easy, not much code required, right? Um, data ownership by feature, this is important. Um, this is something we really learned. We must know who or which element produced that data and they belong together, right? Um, and it's also, it also means a table is, also, is only filled by a single functionality and not from multiple, right? Because then you don't have clear ownership on your, data, on your table level. Um, so here you have to be very consequent. Feature performance monitoring, well, yes. Okay, we have to have this. Um, reprocessing, I think I talked enough about this. Um, in general, it should be like normal processing, right? <laughs> nothing special, we have to reprocess. Well then do, right? Hit that button and nothing more, right? We are not there, definitely not. Um, but we have to get there because this is so, yeah, so important for us uh, also to keep our system running. And everybody may make mistakes, so and then they get afraid. Oh, no mistake. Well, if you have this 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 security net or safety network, uh, safety net there, um, then well, just do what you have to do. And if it goes wrong, just reprocess. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, we have to do multiple uh, mess updates. Um, the state management. Well, we talked about this data access. Well, easy access. Da, da, da. This is this is also a point. As I mentioned, we ran into into the small files syndrome. <laughs> I don't know if who heard of this. If you have a lot small files in your data lake in access, in, in, in parquet files or on on a, on a data lake on S3, for example, and then you read it, the more files you have, the more I/O we have. It's slow. <laughs> so we. And this is a feature from Delta Lake also. Um, you, can, you can read a complete partition. Well, you need a big cluster of um, EMR cluster. You read the partition, can reorganize and write it back. But you produce less files. So we, we are able with this 
algorithm we developed there um, to keep our, our packet files at the size of one gigabyte, let's say. This is, this is a good size for us when reading it, yeah? Um, and we have a lot of data, believe me, the terabytes of data. <laughs> um, yeah, events-based, well, it should be event-based for various reasons, not only for the processing itself, also when we want to expose some data at a specific point or when a specific state has been reached um, and then something should react and spit data to some customer, whatever, via MQTT or whatever. Yeah. Six minutes. This is it, what we want to build. <laughs> a lot of work. We, we, we already built the whole system new in one and a half years. <clears throat> and, well, this is easy. questions by the way well we are hiring right we are growing fast <laughs> we have money um this i want to explain maybe with a bit um the innovation station um this is a new group we want to set up uh, at conux or other way around two twice a year we have an event internal event it's called the festival of ideas um so every every employee or programmer, whatever, gets time, allocated time, to work on a topic he wants to, over half a year or whatever. And during the festival of ideas, this is the place where you can, well, tell the world what cool you have built, right? Um, and if this makes sense also for a product or a new feature or whatever, um, that person can switch to that innovation station. So leave his team build this further right and make it a product or not and supported by a product manager and god knows what right um some marketing guys and, and whatever a product owner and then well finish it and bring it on the market if you want that's cool that's it's, it's a good idea I think. <laughs> that sounds really great uh, thanks a lot for your talk first uh, let's thank the speaker <laughs> And then I think we, we have um, at least around about uh, 10 minutes left for questions. So are there any questions in the room? Could, could I talk more? <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked to, yes. Can we go back <laughs> to <laughs> some five minutes, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any questions in the room? Otherwise we could start with a question from the stream, from Slack. Okay, questions over there. I think I'll pass over the microphone. Um, could you please uh, describe the, so you get the input data, which you get from your uh, nice and very robust sensor. And so what is the actual output that your client has at the end? Uh, the client doesn't get this data we receive from the device. It's, it's a binary file. Um, it varies in size, depending on what the frequency, uh, frequency was it used during recording. So the sampling rate, so the file size could be starting from a couple of kilobytes up to nearly 20 megabytes, a single file. It's one trace. And what we present to the customer is more, let's say, an aggregated view on that data. So features that you extracted from that, that yeah. sound file. Exactly, and like, do you have, do you have like tonnage running over it, speed of a train, and God knows what, right? And and what we, uh, one thing is, this this displacement is an important measure, right? So um, there are there's a threshold defined uh, defined together with the customer, and for one customer, the max allowed, let's say, um, displacement is three millimeters. This uh, the, the the switch is allowed to move up and down when the train runs over it. If it goes over, something goes bad in our system and tells us. <laughs> well, does it answer the question? Okay. Okay, thanks. And maybe we can start with uh, one question from the from the stream. So um, they would be very interested in how you test, build, and deploy your code to the devices. Wow, come on, that's a topic. That's a talk on its own. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have hill setups, hardware in the loop, and these kind of things. We have a lot of test devices. Um, always they are always running tests, right? Everything more or less controlled by Jenkins, uh, where we deploy things on it and test it. And we have a little box 
extra simulating something, let's say. <laughs> um, yeah. But that's a talk on its own. Okay, sounds cool. But maybe you could add uh, one more detail that I also would be interested in. So, so how do you run operations actually? So you have thousands of devices out there um, on the infrastructure. Um, I assume they are connected via 5G or something. So can you update them via remote or do, does somebody have to go there? And... No, it's, uh, it's, it's FOTA uh, firmware over the air. Uh, this is to bring the firmware on it, right? And, and it holds two versions. So the existing version and the new version. Right, so space, it's not big, <laughs> our firmware. So this is one way. And the other way is to configure uh, the, the firmware and the device. Um, this is, so what we did here, we built our own device management system. We looked around and nothing really fits. <laughs> We're a bit special when it comes to this. So we decided, well, what the heck, let's build it, right? Um, yeah. And there, there's always, this is a whole, let's say a complete transaction, right? Um, there's first, it wakes up at some point, a configured point in time. Um, then it sends, every, uh, it, it asks the, the backend, do you have any updates for me, firmware, config or whatever, right? Then it downloads it, blah, blah, blah. And then it starts sending all the data and then the transaction is, is finished. Okay, thanks. Um, any more questions from inside the room maybe? Yeah. So you measure acceleration data, and then you do a double numeric integration to get displacement, right? And I, can't or, answer or, this. Or, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> probably not that simple. No. Um, <laughs> but then you go and you place those devices, and you said um, there are several ways they can be placed, and I would guess that all of these different mounting options and, and the material would affect the data you're measuring. So is there a sort of a calibration step that- Not that... anymore. We had this, but now it's set for the bit. Okay, so that's not necessary. And, no, and it then calibrates you... itself. Uh -huh. it interesting. More or less, the most it's... of it. I mean, there are things like, like train types, which are so different, right? Yeah. Uh, running over it. So this has to be especially trained and God knows what, but the rest is done by the devices. Or the firmware. And, and how do you figure out that oh, this yeah, was a three million? <laughs> <laughs> this is intellectual property. Sorry. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, but maybe we make one more, one more question from the from the chat. So um, they are thinking about your streaming technology. So uh, did you any at any time consider different technology than Spark? To be honest, yeah, we looked into some 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 other stuff. The main problem is um, when you want to use managed services from AWS, right? And this was one of the rules we had. You have these limitations on these services, right? If you want to send a message with 20 megabytes large, no. <laughs> um, we thought about, uh, I forgot the name. I forgot the name. That doesn't matter. In the end, we, do, we, we decided to use, um, to use Spark. I have, I have, I don't know, a 10 years record of using Spark. So um, another thing was also, it, it supports Python. A lot of these others are not supporting this. And the whole analytics and research area is a Python land, let's say. And then they produce Python code, and then we have to rewrite it in Java. Oh. Why? <laughs> Most likely you also have kind of a, a lock-in uh, scenario, right? So if you started with Spark and it works nice, nicely, then um, you have to have a real good reason to, to switch over to yes, a different technology exactly. after a while. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and it's, well, if you run it on EMR, maybe a bit controlled by airflow, what we do, right? I don't see anything beating this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Any questions? from inside the room, anybody? So if that's, uh, that's not the case, then um, we have one more question um, from the chat. If you rebuild your current gen data processing today, what would you do differently? We're doing it right now. <laughs> um, I would have started directly with this, this fine grained elements. These, these pipelines, well, in the beginning we thought it's a good idea, but it, we found out it's not. Um, it is too static a bit, right? You, you, lose, you lose your flexibility. 
you want to add something to a pipeline, it's always a, that is quite a bit of work, right? Um, instead of just hooking into a table and getting the data. Um, and that also enables us, and this is something we are currently working on, on, um, on code generators um, to, to, to generate on the command line complete Spark applications where you just have to deploy, right? Mm -hmm. More or less, or putting SPL in, right? Sure, yeah. um, and with the pipeline, it's not that easy because then you have an additional common code that has to change to wire everything up. Okay, so if you were to, to design this from fresh, you would go a little bit more towards um, a less uh, microservice approach and uh, build more monoliths or? No, no. the opposite. I, I, okay. I, let's okay. say I like, I, somewhere I read this, 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 this phrase, um, Spark is Lambda. I don't know, it was an article somewhere. Um, and that was, that was inspiring for me. Um, using this as, as small units and don't think of a, of a Spark application as a big thing, right? That has to run for weeks and mm -hmm. one million lines of code. Well, it could also be small, right? Mm -hmm. And fast. And then have multiple of those, right? And you can just kick out one and draw the line. Right. <laughs> the other one was before, right? Just two. That's, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's the idea. I would. Okay. Um, maybe one more short question. Anything? Yes. Maybe not really a short question, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, for your customers, uh, you said they have like those regular intervals to go to, to the switches and check them. Yeah. With this technology, can they actually reduce those intervals and have like actual gain right away? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's well, that's part of our mission, right? Um, I mean, first of all, the prerequisite is they have to believe in this, that it really works, that it tells them the truth and not some story, right? And provided that acceptance, right? Um, this is continuously observing the switch and not just going there every three months because this is just a snapshot. And two days later, something could happen and you won't realize. So that's basically there's no law or rules saying no rules or whatever that they have to still do it in this model. Well, currently they're still doing it. There is a rule. There's, every, there's a rule for everything in Germany, right? <laughs> <laughs> so they, they still go there, right? And, and do their normal inspections. And they have this system running in parallel. Um, because this proving phase is, is still, we are in the middle of this, right? Because, well, if you do predictions and we do predictions for, well, let's say track blood displacement and we do predictions for, I don't know, in 30 days, you will have a displacement of 2.9 millimeters. So if you start today, this evaluation, well, <laughs> you have to produce the first data for 30 days and then you can compare. Okay, this is now this really situation, what has been predicted. And that's the phase we're currently in. But looks good. <laughs> okay, thanks a lot. I think we have to, to empty the room, so we have to just thank our speaker once more. It was a pleasure. <laughs> okay, and then have a nice one. <laughs>